God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, as they say in southern Israel, shalom, y'all. <laughs> so good to be back, and thank you for your thoughts, your prayers, and your covering. So repeat after me, Boker Tov. Good morning. Tov is good. Boker, good morning. Uh, Leila Tov, good night. Model Tov, good life, right? Repeat after me, Toda. Toda. Thank you. Toda, Toda, Toda. For all, again, the prayers were palpably felt. The weather was phenomenal. It was everything and exceeded all expectation. As we, again, were with 28 different pastors from all different denominations, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Pentecostal, three Episcopalian. Um, it was wonderful, and we all got along famously. Go figure, one bread, one body. It was wonderful. Up front, I will tell you that I will apologize. You will get tired of hearing me say when I was in Israel, so get used to it. But above all, the palpable presence of the Spirit in so many places. If you've been watching the news, in fact, we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, we're seeing an outpouring of revival taking place in different colleges and in chapels and in different churches, prayers and singing going on for weeks, literally at a time. And while we are in so many of the locations in Israel, you would have people from Moravia, people from the Philippines, people from Russia, all over. All of a sudden, we would break out in song, break out in prayer. It really was something to see that we could get beyond our differences and be brothers and sisters in faith together. What an image of hope. But as we see in our gospel today, we see that sometimes the movement of the Spirit isn't always easy to detect, let alone to be a part of, especially when it challenges our long-held assumptions, our facade of identity, or plainly our capacity for humility to say, I don't know, I don't understand. Today we are met with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, one of the places in the Bible that we all need to know. And so if you have a Bible with you or one of your apps, pull it out because we're going to kind of go line by line through John chapter 3. Now there was a man, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Nicodemus was held in high regard. He would have been seen as a Jewish senator a representative, somebody of high status, definitely a member of the board and on the in crowd. John chapter three, starting at the beginning. This is great. In fact, as Episcopalians, you know, it's okay to bring your Bibles into church, by the way. <laughs> We're allowed to do this because the proclamation of the word should be a proclamation of the gospel, but also an equipping so that we learn from God's word. This is, by the way, if you don't know, this is my preaching Bible. I've had this for 23 years. Notes, highlights, all kinds of stuff written in. And it's, uh, it helps me to go back and go, what was I thinking three years ago? Or, wow, I forgot about how this moves. So, there was a man named Nicodemus, a man of high regard, a man of stature, a man of position, a member of the council who comes to Jesus at night. Why at night? He didn't want to be seen by anybody. He wasn't that convicted that Jesus was who he said he was enough to risk his position, risk his reputation. But listen to what he says. Rabbi, we know, so there were other people that were going along with him. They were part of this group. We know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you do. You are doing if you were not a part of him. So even though Nicodemus doesn't get it yet, he's struggling. He's seeking at least enough to come and seek Jesus out even 
at night. Have you ever struggled with the faith? Ever wanted to know more and felt like maybe you were hitting a spiritual wall, that there was more on the other side, more to comprehend? Nicodemus wants to know, but he's not sure enough to risk his position yet. He might be embarrassed. He's not confident enough in where he stands to be able to defend the fact that he went and met with Jesus. Or he was afraid of the change that might occur in his life when he lets himself go and be led by the Holy Spirit. Ever been afraid of that which you do not know? That which is around the corner that you may not understand? That which God may be drawing you to and you resist because it's uncomfortable? Nicodemus was in that place. You'll also see as we work through the Gospel of John that John loves to present things in duality. His Gospel is very different. It's much more of a conversation than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John uses light and dark, bread and wine, body and blood. He uses this duality as part of his poetic presence. And so the fact that Nicodemus comes at night in the dark where light represents truth, light represents God, Darkness represents deception, and darkness represents temptation and evil. So Nicodemus comes to him at night and says again, with earnestness and I think sincerity, I'm seeing what you're doing. It's touching my heart in a way that I can't understand. And so I'm coming to you to, to help me, to help me see this in a deeper fashion. Jesus replies, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Well, this triggers Nicodemus, and he goes right to his logic. How many of us are logical people, and how many of us are more emotional people? Well, it doesn't fit, especially those engineers of you out there. If it doesn't fit into your grid system, A, B, C, and D, in the proper order, you don't want to know about it. God says, it's my way. It's my way. Follow my way, and I will be your protector and guide. As we heard in our psalm, I will shield you from the sun of the day, from the moon at night. But sometimes it's hard to trust when we're worried, when we're afraid, when we don't see around the corner. So Nicodemus goes into this, I think, frustrated mode. How can a man be born again? You can hear the frustration. Surely he cannot come into his, his, his mother's womb a second time and be born. How does this doesn't make sense to us? And again, this goes along with their theological understanding for, for the Jews following the laws, not just the Ten Commandments, but the 300 laws that were extrapolated from them, following the laws to the, get, to the letter meant their salvation. You were either saved or you weren't by the works. This is called works righteousness. And sometimes we fall in, if I do enough, if I go to church enough, if I read the Bible enough, then I'll be worthy of God's love. And that doesn't work that way. In fact, as we were on the plane leaving Newark, ready for a 10-hour flight to Tel Aviv, it was about 3 in the morning, and we were just finding that uncomfortable spot in the seat where you could maybe get a little bit of sleep. All of a sudden, we heard the overhead compartments opening and closing and opening and closing. We had a large number of Hasidic Jews on the flight. Big hats, curly, you know, the black outfits. And all of a sudden, they are putting on their prayer shawls. They are putting on what's called a phylactery, a little box that ties to your head so that the word of God is close to your mind. Straps around, and they're sitting in the aisles of the plane. Well, at <laughs> three in the morning because that was the equivalent time of the sun rising in Jerusalem. Following the law meant their salvation. So when Jesus is inviting Nicodemus to kind of go out, not outside of the law, but to reinterpret the law, it's shaking his logic. He doesn't get it. How can somebody be born again? Surely you cannot enter the womb a second time. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh but spirit gives birth to spirit you shouldn't be surprised about this so now there's some frustration on jesus's side again 
both of them are running into unmet expectations. I think Jesus had hoped that Nicodemus, by coming to him, would be a little more open to a new movement. And he's running into that wall of, this is the way we always do it. And sometimes this is the way we always do it hinders our reception of a movement of the Spirit in our life when God needs us to wake up and see things a different way. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from. You cannot tell where it goes. So it is with everybody born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus says, how can this be? See, they were used to what was called a ritual bath. So we were in Cana of Galilee, where Jesus turns water into wine. And they had stone containers as big as this pulpit. And they would fill it to the brim for a wedding so that they could be ritually purified in preparation for the wedding. So water, of course, meant life. When you're in the desert and there's nothing but rocks anywhere, water was life. But to be changed on the inside was foreign to them. You can then also understand that when Jesus turned water into wine, there were gallons of new wine to be consumed at that party. What a party it must have been, huh? How can this be, Nicodemus says? And Jesus then goes again with frustration. You're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand this, Nicodemus. I tell you the truth that you speak what you know. We testify to what we've seen, but still people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you about earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven except those who come from heaven and the Son of Man will ascend. So Jesus is giving a prophetic uh, pointer to the fact that someday he will ascend to heaven in his bodily form. And then he talks about as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. Basically, it was to have faith in what God did over what we see logically and practically in our lives. It can be so challenging for us. We are people of the flesh. We like to touch and know and smell and see and understand but very often God brings us to a place where we have to trust in him and have faith that if we step out of the boat we're going to walk on water when it makes absolutely no sense to us in the flesh what is your reaction when you're faced with assumptions that don't make sense to you when you're faced with evidence that doesn't meet your narrative in your life. Do you get angry? Do you get frustrated? Do you just go, la, 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 it doesn't make sense to me, so I don't want to have any part of it because it's uncomfortable? Again, I might be embarrassed. I might have to say I don't know. Mark Twain reminds us, it's a lot easier to fool a person than to convince them they've been fooled. None of us want to feel gullible. We don't want to feel ill-equipped. Used to be a joke in our family with my dad that we never heard the words, I don't know, out of his mouth. But sometimes we don't know. If we're honest with ourselves, we may have been in a position sometimes in conversation with somebody when they presented a person or a fact or a place and we didn't know it, but we said we did. Oh, we know about this. You don't know, but you go, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. We don't like to not know. But God wants to make himself known to us. And he makes himself known to us through the person of Jesus Christ. Because in our humanity, we are incapable. But in his divinity, he was capable of becoming a person so that we could touch him, hug him, put our hands and feet into his side, hear him, have him breathe upon us and be changed. Church isn't just a place where we gather together and say hello, which is a wonderful thing. Church should be a place when we come into the presence of the living God and the presence of word and sacrament that we expect an encounter with the living Holy Spirit in our midst. 
that we expect to be changed in the way that we cannot be changed by ourselves. One of the constant feelings that was across all of us as pastors on this trip, as we drank from the theological fire hose, for sure, was the more we learned, the more we knew we didn't know. The more there was a sense of humility before the cross. The more there was a sense of, Lord, open my mind to your scripture like you breathed upon the disciples so that we could return home to our communities and be more equipped, more effective in sharing what God is doing so that you would know that you know that you know that God is present. He is not some old book from 2,000 years ago. He is alive and in our midst right here, right now, through the power of his spirit. I think Nicodemus wanted to know so bad that he was afraid. Afraid to be embarrassed in front of his friends. Embarrassed to have that conviction. But what we do know is at the end of Jesus' ministry, he does stand up for the life of Christ in the Sanhedrin to keep him from crucifixion. He does go to Pilate with Joseph of Arimathea to claim his body. He does risk his position for what he has come to know as a new way, a new way of freedom, a new way of transformation. And as we journey through these days of Lent, we are invited to come before the Lord in all humility and penitence and to be willing to say, Lord, I don't get it, but I want it. And I know you can help me get there if I have faith the size of a mustard seed and that there can be new encounters of his spirit over these coming days, new encounters of love, new encounters of redemption, new encounters of opportunity where we can shed that which we don't need to carry in our lives anymore and breathe the free air of the Holy Spirit which he desires most deeply for us. That we can let go of uh, fear, of worry, of the loss of control, of the expectation of some outer facade that we doesn't match with our inner self. Be willing to let go of all that you have so that you can allow the life and love of Jesus to pervade in your heart and in your mind. And the beautiful thing is that we don't have to have the answer for this. You don't have to white-knuckle this. All you have to do is come before the Lord and say, Lord, help me because I know this is what you want. And the basis of John 3.16 is this. For God so loved you and our God is beyond time. He's beyond past, present, and future. God knew, this will make you crazy, God knew on the cross that someday you would be, and that someday you would be here in this church today to hear his word, and that he would die for you by name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send, did not send, did not send his son to condemn us. So much of the world thinks that we're just about judgment and condemnation when we are about freedom in the spirit. For God did not send his son to condemn us, but to save us save you and to save me. May we walk together as the body of Christ to the day of Palm Sunday, to the day of crucifixion, and to the day of resurrection. And may we be filled with the spirit of the Son who is willing to give his life for us. Todah, Yeshua. Todah. Amen.